Okay. Ready? I feel like I have you on this forward, fast track. Um, so I'm going to um, jump right back in. And then what I will do is open for questions before we go to lunch. So if you have any questions, make note of it, and then I'll take them before we go to lunch, because I don't want to leave great big huge gaps. But um, now, I want to emphasize that choice is the fundamental power of the human experience. Number two is every one of us lives in complete unawareness of how powerful every choice you make is. And number two, how many choices you make in a microsecond. That every, that, you know, that people tend to think that a choice is, should I have coffee or tea? That it's an, something you're conscious of. What should I wear? Um, that, that you, you know, should I go to a workshop or not? That a choice, this is what you think of as a choice. Every single thing, your response to weather, your response to, 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 to what you respond to as you see, beautiful day, not beautiful day, nice mountain, not, not nice mountain, oh, there's a bird, hate birds, love birds, da, 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 da. It, every single, what you need to do is imagine that you are like a sparkler sparking off responses, reactions, and every one of those is a choice. That energy is always in motion. This is a law of the universe. This is one of the laws. Every law of science is a, has its mystical law counterpart. There isn't one law of science that does not have its celestial mystical counterpart. Every single one, because the physical laws are in fact a reflection of the mystical laws. You are always in motion. You are never not making choices. The significance of understanding a chart like this is that you kind of get a grasp of the different levels of choices that you make. The speed at which these choices influence your relationship to the creation of matter and the uncreation of it. I'm going to say that again. This is, this is not just a jewel. This is like the Maharaji ruby. The speed at which this choice I'm making is going to densify into matter. I'm going to give you an example. This one needs an example or a dozen. One of the <clears throat> teachings of Carl Jung was there's nothing lower than herd, the herd mind, the mind of the group, the mad mind. The mind that screams, you know, kill him, kill him, sacrifice him. The, the, the madness that happens when you blend your individual thinking mechanism and you toss it over to what the group believes and you cease to be able to reason. You cease to be able. The way I think that a lot of people are tossing their minds over to people in the political race. They're not reasoning. They're no longer reasoning. They're hysterical. And archetypally, we've reached a place of hysteria because we are reliving, as, as you'll, you'll see when we get to archetypes, the archetypal patterns of the Civil War, World War I, as it then gave way to the beginning of World War II and the Nazi era. The exact same dynamics are in place. Exact, exact, 
exact. Wars repeat themselves because history repeats themselves itself. This is a law. This is a law. History repeats itself unless you learn and break the pattern. Even in your own life, you'll repeat yourself unless you choose to break the pattern. What's a mystical law? These are laws. These are laws. You'll repeat yourself unless you yourself break the pattern. What is, here's a law. What's in one is in the whole. What we do as individuals, we will redo as society because if we redo it as an individual, it creates the whole. We're the engines of society. The moment the Southern Republicans withdrew their support from the president, it was a declaration of the Civil War and the pattern engaged. The pattern engaged. Now my point here is that when a person takes their individual mind and tosses it and becomes part of the way the group thinks without thinking anymore and becomes a we instead of an I, and just, well, he's a Muslim, he wasn't born here, he's this, he's that, they're short, they're this, they're that, they're all this, they're all coming at us, they're this, whatever it is. They're no longer able to be, to be rational. Any kind of we thought, that converts to the speed at which you can heal anything. And number two, it also converts to, the, to your immune system and its susceptibility to epidemics. Group mind, group immune system, epidemics are a product of the collective becoming toxic. And now we are living in an era of one epidemic surfacing per year. And that's never happened before. And it is an indicator that our collective immune system, our collective thinking, has become collectively toxic, fragile, and frightened. This is not something that an ordinary person in, and I don't mean ordinary by the way I mean it, but say the common mind could grasp this is a mystical perspective. This, you've got to be off, you've got to be up here. Any more than down here, this is creationism. The, the world was literally created in six days. You have to come up here and, and recognize that is a mystical code. Not a literal one, but if you take it literally, the healing, the code, can't come through to you. If you are in the tribal mind, you cannot access energy medicine. It's not going to happen. Acupuncture won't help you. It might alleviate pain for an hour. An hour! But it won't help you. Someone in the tribal mind cannot be helped by homeopathy, acupuncture, not even massage. It might alleviate the stress feeling for an afternoon, but believe you me, it'll be right back there. It's not possible because they are too dense. They have too much time in them and their health has too many other people's mind involved. Their illness is not a product of just their personal choice, but of the choices of millions of people that they have plugged into. Am I making sense here? They have a tribal disorder, not an individual one. So if they say, well, what's the one reason? It's not a one reason. You are a product of a tribal disorder. 
tribal. So you have to heal at the rate. And so I can treat you, but acupuncture is an individual treatment of an individual energy field. And I, and I can't alleviate the prejudice of a tribe that is in your blood and bones now with needles. I can't do it. I have to find a medical treatment that the tribe approves of, chemotherapy. The tribe likes chemotherapy. The tribe likes this. How about that? Now that's something the tribe believes in. So I have to go find tribal medicine. And it will heal you or not at the speed of the tribe. Because if I take you out of the tribe, and I say, we're going to try this. We're going to try a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. The tribe will respond with hostility because you are now operating with something that has thought forms that go faster than they can reason. Said differently, they are working with, with, a, with light that has the capacity to destroy the dark in the cell tissue, to burn the time, to work faster than the time, which means that your thought forms will change faster than theirs. And they won't be able to maintain authority over you, if you want to put it in the language of consciousness. If you use these, you will come to an understanding that's outside of the way we understand. We can't allow that. So it's, at that point, follow me. You've got to follow me. It's got nothing to do with healing. It's got to do with sabotaging the consequence of how you will see reality if this works. Can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. I can repeat it. Is this making sense? It's got to do with the reason why, let's say that you're my child, and I'm your mama, and I'm very traditional. I'm, I'm someone who believes in creationism. I'm a fundamentalist. I believe that the, world, that the Bible says exactly. I'm a first chakra person. I'm a good person, but this is what I believe. And I want you to believe that, and all the rest of my children. Now you get sick, and I take you to a doctor, and the doctor is, says, you know, we need, to, we need to, to have chemotherapy, and we need to have this, and we need to have this. And everybody in the tribe understands, and the family has, knows this doctor, knows that's it. You have to have surgery, you have to be in the hospital, everybody understands this. Then a nurse comes in and says, you know what, there's also some other things we can do here. I want you to read these books. And it's about, you know, um, talking about how you're feeling, middle column. Talking about, you know, what's going on in your life and what your feelings are. And, you know, like maybe making some different choices. Maybe your, your nutrition, maybe, you know, did, did you ever want to do something? Do you like your job? Do you like what you're doing? Because maybe, maybe this is a good time for you to evaluate your personal choices. Instead of, and you say to me, well, I don't know, I don't know. I'll come back the next day and we'll talk about it. This is too fast for you. We can't, I'll give you more time, first column. I'll give you a little more time. Because you need more time. Because you're still, you have to first think all about the tribe. Because that's what you're used to. So I come back the next day and I nudge you a little bit more, a little bit more, because you've got the tribe in your head. There's not just one of you. There's a whole tribe I'm talking to. Because you have to heal at the speed of all of them. So then the next day I come in and I say, so that is just you and me, just you and me. When you have a tribe in your head, you're thinking, what will they say? This is the they you talk about. What will they say? This is my imitation of being on the cross. What will they say? 
and I try to get you to talk just about you. So you start talking, you say, well, I don't know, you know, I kind of always, I'm always doodling, and, and I kind of always wanted to do something artistic. And, and I say, what? you know what? When you get sick, sometimes it's the greatest gift in the world because it can be a game changer. It's an opportunity for you to say, you know what? Life needs to be about what I want to do, if I can. I need to make some fundamental choices because I'm not happy here. And this is, I'm not happy. I'm not here to make them happy. I'm not happy. And now all of them in your head are going like this. <laughs> and you're thinking how, and now it's all going on in here. But something in your middle is beginning to feel like, now we're talking. And it's the little engine that could. And this spark feels like it has a different voltage than the tribal. This one feels like. And that seems like, I don't know, this has a different hum, buzz to it. It feels more, I'm getting high off of this. I'm frightened, but I'm high. The agony ecstasy, the, the, there's a bolt to this. It feels like lightning light. And the other feels like just getting by. Just enough to get by. Regular versus super lead. And once this spark starts, it will not leave you alone. It is relentless. Comes to visit every morning. Remember me? Spark, spark. And it starts to hurt you if you don't plug it into something. It will start to hurt you. Which is its greatest, it's like, I'm going to start to bite you. I'm really going to start to make you miserable. I will, I will, I will, I will. And it's the best thing I can do is make you so eager to try out your own life. You don't belong to other people. You don't, don't, don't. You can hang with them. You can love them. You can be part of their life. But you've got to find out who you are. I'm going to hit a pause button. This may come as news to a lot of people, but you were not born knowing yourself. You know nothing about yourself unless you go and figure that out. You don't even know what you like. You don't know what makes you tick. You don't know what your shadow is and you don't know what your light is. You don't know what your potential is. You don't know how deeply you can love and you don't even know how deeply you can hate. You don't know any of that stuff. You don't even know what your archetypes are. You don't even know what your patterns are. You know zilch about yourself unless you decide to know yourself. And for most people, what they know is their wounds and they think that's a big deal. And that, quite frankly, is boring. And it gets you into trouble if you start there. You become just a bore. Because you never get into your power. You never get into the good stuff because you get such a kick out of the dark stuff. Because it becomes such good street currency. Oh, I've been wounded, I've been wounded. Oh, geez, now what? Well, I get the best seat in the house and you have to talk to me in a certain way. No, I don't. Oh, you're so rude. The power of the wound. When you discover yourself, you have to tell the tribe. And they're not going to want you to do that. So when you say to them, the nurse came by and she suggested I read this pamphlet. And I did. So I think that I'm going to try out, you know, I'm going to go to this place and get a Pilates teacher and maybe get a, maybe you learn a little yoga. And I might try this nutritional program. I'm going to I think I'm going to cut out fried foods because I don't think it's really good for what I'm going through. We always eat fried food. Now, they're not going to want you to follow that. Not because it's not good for you, 
but because you're saying you're different. And they're not going to be able to support that. Not at all. Very few will be able to say, good for you, you're different than us, and we're wrong, and we're eating unhealthy. They're not going to be able to, well, what, what's wrong with the way I cook? Are you saying there's something wrong with the way I cook? What are you saying here? This isn't about you. It's not about me. They'll make it about them. They'll, and they'll just create another stress. And you'll just, no, it's not. All right, fine. Give me some fried chicken. And, do you see what I'm going here? And it's very difficult. And what happens is they'll reel you in so that the speed at which you heal is something they can live with. When in fact, this was an opportunity for you to say, I could heal, I could take, if I get your mind out of my mind, what I'm actually doing is altering the speed at which I can heal. I can increase the, my potential to heal a lot faster if I get your thought forms out of mine. Are you following this? Because here, because every thought form that you hold on to is psychic weight. And the more weight, the longer you have to wait for everything. That's your formula. Weight equals weight. This is how we create our relationship to time. In all things, in all things. In everything. This is how time is, our, how we really, which is why when you're having a great time and you are fully present, it feels like it, it feels like it just flew by. Like did all that time really go? And when you are absolutely like, I, if I don't get out of here, it feels like forever because you're not fully present and you're anchored everywhere else and every minute feels like a day and every day feels like a year. You're playing games with where you are in your head, with perception, and you've anchored yourself to the densest first chakra perceptions. Illness has a lot to do with being anchored in dense perceptions. with being anchored in dense perceptions. Okay. Okay, so now to continue this endless story, but it's important. I hope you don't mind me telling it this way, but I feel like getting to the point where the light bulb went on is kind of a journey that helps me to teach this. A little bit. When I was into why people don't heal, I learned a great deal about us, and therefore you, which is how dark and manipulative we can be. How many of our choices are choices that are simply not good, and how deep and 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 how important it is. Bless you for us to get a handle on our own shadow. On our own shadow. Which is, now, I'm gonna shift gears here and go to what was happening in our society, because it's important. Simultaneously in our society, um, as the shadow was becoming very popular to look at, the wounded child, the orphan child, blah, 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 all of that, it's very significant to look at this part of ourselves. But what was happening is that the body, mind, spirit template was getting morphed into the body, mind, mind. And nobody, there was very little, and the spirit part 
was becoming a mental companion and not truly a road to a spiritual journey. That how people were, if you look at the literature, you look at what was happening at the time, the books that came out, the experience, anything about God became more of a mental examination than in fact what the spiritual path was all about. Yoga became an exercise when in fact it's a spiritual practice. Became what people did at lunchtime. And no mention of God or spirit was allowed because it was an exercise. Became the thing that was very vogue. It went along with change of nutrition. It went along, retreats became about silence. <laughs> okay, prayer in any form. I cannot tell you how many times people would say, I didn't come here to pray and it was a workshop on spirituality. <laughs> so I stopped introducing anything at all. The hostility toward God the hostility toward religion was completely being mixed with a hostility toward God and believing. Believing in anything. And it became obvious to me as the decade wore on that the theology people had was that what they became, their faith, they had more faith in what they didn't believe than in faith in what they did. And that what people put on the table when you talked about God was their defiance of this is what I don't believe. And they knew that for sure. But they had absolutely no idea what they did believe. And in fact, believing anything, the belief mechanism had grown rusty, if not completely broken. People did not know how to believe, much less what to believe. So it was not a surprise to me at all that turning to fundamentalism had become rampant because fundamentalism is routine and ritual. It's not faith. It's routine and ritual and community. But it is not a mystical experience. It is not an experience of God. It is simply a community control and, and ritual. But, that's, but it is by no means the mystical outlet. In the meantime, we're living in a society in which having faith in anything is not paying off. The banks are betraying us, the Wall Street is, the church is, priests are, you name it, it's going down. And at a more personal level, Marriages have never been more corrupt. It doesn't matter if you take a vow or anything. There's, having faith in another person is a crapshoot. So the whole faith mechanism, and in fact, having faith in yourself has become an effort. Keeping your word for, to yourself the, the, in classes, it has been banned to even have a class on moral conscience. On what is the conscience in, in, in public schools? That's banned because it's considered religious. You can't even bring up conscience, conscience, the mechanism of what is right and what is wrong. What is, and that is tied to your intuition. That is the trigger word, and we get to the power of words, for how you know your basic intuition. What is your conscience? That's your second degree of intuition. The fundamental working of your conscience. The nature of light and shadow, right and wrong. And what is nature's way, a return to ordinary, a return to balance? I feel like I, 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 this isn't right, this is right, da, da. This is your gut instinct. It follows the guidance of conscience. And one of the things we did 
was we tossed out the word conscience, we never use it, and we use the word consciousness, which means nothing. Nothing at all. It can mean whatever we want. I'm very conscious I recycle. Well, I'm very conscious I eat wheats and berries. But it has nothing. When someone says they're on a seminar on consciousness, nobody ever, ever, ever associates morality with that word. Ethics, justice, nobody. Confession, writing your ship inside, nobody. And yet, let's go back down Intuition relies on conscience. You can never be a clear intuitive if you don't have an active conscience. It is not possible. Not at all. Not possible. Zero. Cannot. Is that puzzling to you? Okay. Can't. Can't. You will. You will make things up. You will make things up. You will simply make it up. Because you have no capacity to trust yourself. And number two is, if you do not read your own clearly, what will happen to you is this. You will live with two words as your sidekick. I blame that person for everything. And number two, you will live in a world of, I deserve this. I've had a bad day. I deserve that. Number three, you will live in a constant state of self-inflicted wounds and suffering. You will, and, and you can't, you won't be able to heal any of this, and the likelihood that you will become an addict is 90%. You'll become an addict to behavior patterns, you'll become an addict to self-pity, maybe drugs, maybe food, maybe booze, but you will be an addict. There's no way, to, you will, there is, it is impossible, impossible, impossible not to be an addict. Questions? <laughs> no. No, no. If you have questions about it, what do you need? You want me to repeat that? It's worth repeating. Do you need a repeat? Yes. Okay. When you block out your conscience, you block out a fundamental monitoring system that keeps you balanced. You don't listen to yourself. So you'll repress it. But you will feel it. You'll feel it in your blood and your bones. In order to deal with this, because you have blocked out the mechanism, you have to find some, you have to project it out. It's obviously not you, because you're not reflective. Can't figure out what you've done. Because you're not listening to yourself. So it must be something in the outside world, it must be someone in the outside world. Because it's not you, because you're not paying attention to yourself. You don't ask yourself, you don't question, what did, I, what did I do here? What kind of choice did I make? Where is it coming from? Why did I do that? But instead you turned your wounded, oh, I'm so wounded. Maybe that, I, I'm, I'm passing on my suffering. Why? Because I want to. Because I want to. Because I deserve to. You're playing that game. And then what happens is you get into this cycle because it works for you, or however it is you do. And you blame another situation, another person, another place. My childhood, my this, my future childhood, I don't know, some karma, whatever. In order to stay in the cycle you're in. And in order to not progress here. In order to not go a stage up in, in, in your awareness of the choices you're making and why, you'll level off. And to maintain leveling in the dark, you have to be an addict. Because inevitably, the light will try and come through. And every time it does, it's called truth. You'll drug it in some way. You'll drug the light. So you'll either be an alcoholic, a, a food addict, a, a, a behavior addict. It's time for me to scream. You'll be some kind of addict 
that will stop the light from coming through, which is the realization. I, this is, I'm, I'm doing something not right here. I, and because the realization is always about, truth is always about recognizing I'm doing something that's not okay here. Because that's what growth is. And it always is about, I have to make some different choices here. And that shifts the playing field of your life, which shifts everything, the capacity to heal, what you can get, what you're like, the types of illnesses you're likely to get now versus these. It shifts everything. The infusion of truth changes everything. Now, did that make sense to you? But you will be an addict. That's where addicts come from, yeah. Oh, it's, is, is the antithesis the opposite of that? No, another style is self-blame. Blame is blame. And you never just blame yourself. If you're a blamer, you'll blame anything that comes along. <laughs> yeah, but if you're hard on yourself, you'll be hard on others. It just depends on, on your need. Today it's hard on others. Tomorrow it's hard on the system. Tomorrow, third, it's hard on the airlines. Fourth, you'll always be, if you're a blamer, you're a blamer. It's an archetype. You know, it's an archetype. It depends on the circumstance. If it's a memory about something, then you're hard on yourself. If it's this, it depends. You, a blamer's never not a blamer. It's a lifestyle. And maybe there are some things that are like perfume blame incidences in which you have something. But then there are eau de toilette, there's cologne, there's you know, major and minor, but if you're a blamer, you're a blamer. Blaming yourself is guilt? Blaming yourself is guilt. You have guilt. You know, you have guilt for something. But, but a bl blame comes from, there's got to be a reason, one reason, and, and, and that's a blame is like, there, and that person, there's one reason for this, and da, da, da. It's, and it's a need to actually come to the one cause and oneness and oneness why that one thing happened. Blame says, I know exactly why this happened, and, it, and if I hadn't done this, it just wouldn't have happened, and I am in control. Blamers kid themselves about their control. Are you a control freak? Yeah. No, no, that would be a yes or a no answer here. You don't get to interpret. This would be yes or no. I said control, as, as evidenced by you wandering down the <laughs> path, thinking I'm not hot on your heels. But look, look behind you, and there I am. You didn't answer my question. They should let me interview a politician. I said, yeah. No, that, that's a form of control. That's a form of control. And, and we all have that. We all have that. And, um, but when blame becomes the lifestyle. Every one of us says, you know, I have episodes of blame. Blame, episodes, episodic behavior is not a, uh, an archetypal pattern. We all have episodic behaviors of blame. I'm talking when it becomes, when the blamer is an archetype. But I will tell you when there is a stage of consciousness at which it's a lifestyle because you don't want to look at something, so you keep projecting out. When, and when you are a blamer, when blaming and um, uh, treating yourself, I deserve, deserve, I, and even when you think that person deserves, that per person doesn't deserve this. When you think in these words, and they are part of the lexicon of your reality, the, the scale, 
like the lady of the scales. Like, like the way we think, this kind of stuff is so startling to me. When there are big disasters, like I remember all the write-ups, do you remember that big tsunami in the South Pacific, was the Philippines or was it Indonesia. Indonesia and all those people, and what were they saying? All those innocent people, really? Or should we have emptied prisons and said, okay, all you innocent people on these boats, all you people guilty, get on there, you're gonna die now. What do you mean by innocent people? What the heck are we talking about? What does that mean? What a ridiculous way to think. That you mean that people need to deserve and do something bad before a natural disaster? That unless they've done something bad, they shouldn't die? And if, one, if two or more people die at one time, that, that somehow or other, that unless they've done something bad to deserve it, this is how we think. And this is, an, this is a flaw in our fundamental mechanism that says there is a myth that if we're good, bad things shouldn't happen to us. And that that's how this off-planet God works. That if we're good little children, this is how thick the myth is, it comes through our journalists. Nobody is, is writing the newspaper saying, excuse me, but I don't believe in this off-planet God. We just accept this as a social creed. That they're innocent people. Innocent, who's judging them? Well, they didn't do anything to deserve. Well, then if they had, who should have decided that? The cosmic court. But who's God? I mean, who, who, where, where are you getting this? It's because collectively we have this idea, this belief, this primal tribal belief that if we are good, bad things shouldn't happen to us. That is the primal law of karma that is in our nature. This is the nature of our nature. That says somehow or other, if I stay balanced, I gotta figure out what that balance is. Otherwise, if I don't deserve things, I get to do some bad things. If, if bad things happen to me and I don't deserve them, I get to do bad things in return to other people because bad things happen to me. I get to punish other people. I get to make them feel bad and pass on my injuries to them and that's what people do. I get to come home with a bad day and yell at them and beat them up for my bad day. I deserve it because I've had a bad day. Okay, so long as people live in that consciousness, they'll be an addict. They will be addicts. They'll be an addict to their own wounds and the power of their wounds. They'll be an addict to their own privilege. Didn't you, I came here to see you, you have to talk to me. I'll be an addict, they'll be an addict to something. And they can't get out of it. And that's this level of consciousness. And this level comes with a certain speed. So if you gave me a list of illnesses, I'll say, if you're in this speed, you can't heal it. This kind of illness requires this kind of speed. I'm telling you, it's just mechanics, it's law. It's law. You're not, you've got too much density in you for that illness, now it's just law. It's like the teacher Jesus, these and other things can you heal, but just learn the laws, stop it. Bam, he should have slapped him around. Get out of yourselves. That's what healing is about, get out of yourselves. And one of the greatest gifts you can learn, one of the biggest jewels, here's a crown jewel, stop taking yourself personally. Stop it. 
You are not the center of the universe. Stop it. Stop treating yourself like you are. Stop thinking you're privileged. Stop thinking you're special. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Your whole life is going to go down better. Stop it. Nothing about life was structured for you. Nothing. Not being a mother, dear God, all these people, when they put baby on board, what are you supposed to do with that? Not hit the car? <laughs> I don't care if you have a baby on board. What am I supposed to do with that? I want a sign that says dog on board. Abby on board. You know what? Ugh. You know? Um, there's nothing, nothing, nothing special. And that's where you, the moment you start thinking you are is the moment you think the laws of the universe do not apply to you. And you will become a lawbreaker. You will break the laws. And you will think you have a right to break the laws. Because you're extraordinary and the laws don't apply to you. You will become a lawbreaker. You'll become a metaphysical criminal if not a physical one. And you'll think you're special and you get to break the laws. They don't apply to me. And you'll be the person who says to me, I can't believe this illness happened to me. Why? Because I'm special. I'm special. I mean, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I'm special. Well, who did you think should get this illness? Well, that person across the street. I drive a Jaguar. And they don't. They drive a Honda. This is a Honda illness. <laughs> After all. OK, this is how people think. This is how I get the laws don't apply. I named my child Sunshine Meditation Karma so that ordinary things wouldn't happen to the child. And now something ordinary is happening. The system doesn't work. There is no God. There isn't, isn't, isn't. This is how human beings think. And they're all wrong. Yeah, honey. I'm sorry, but darling, I'm going to have to have David give you the microphone. So there's been a massive movement uh, in self-development in recent years, and kind of simply, what you're saying, it seems like simply creating an additional addiction of being special. And I'm just curious to your take, would you shine some light on the cultural and the historical kind of roots of when this started and why it's seems to be so prevalent, especially in the West right now. Yeah, because it actually feeds into this. And that's the birth of the inner self. Your timing's perfect. I really do credit entering the nuclear age. And I cannot emphasize enough that when we entered that age, well, let me say it this way. I brought up yesterday, but I brought this up yesterday, and it, it's such a big deal that our design, our basic nature, is like we have two wheels in us, and it's the we have that 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 make up the human design. We have the need to create and the need to survive. These are the two wheels that make us our species. Uh, you know, all the other species have the need to survive, but we have that extra wheel, which is the need to create. So if you look at the history of our species, we're always, you know, creating from the wheel to fire to the next, to the next, to the next. And our mythologies, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, all the stories of mythology, study the mythologies and uh, from the, everything you can get your hands on, Asian mythologies, there's stories about creation and whether the gods approved, whether the gods inspired it. One of the myths that are, is applicable to your question, particularly, is the myth of Prometheus, stealing the fire from Zeus. 
and how he was so enraged he hung Prometheus out to have the, the birds eat his liver constantly, but he sent to punish Earth. He got his goddesses together and he says, create me a false goddess, create me a fraud, but make her an attractive broad. Because I'm going to give her to Epimetheus as a, the brother of Prometheus, who, by the way, had warned his brother and said, don't accept anything from the gods. I'm telling you, they can be very cheeky. But Hermes was called and delivered this handmaiden goddess. But as they were going about leaving heaven, well, Olympus, Zeus gave Pandora a box and said, here's your wedding present. Don't open it. And he's laughing because he had said to, to, to Athena and, and, and Hermes, you make sure she is very beautiful, but particularly curious. And then he says, don't you open this wedding present. Shows up at the door of Epimetheus, and of course, she opens it up. And everybody knows that in Pandora's box are all the toils of humanity, illness and grief, struggle, poverty, and of course, hope. Now, I want to fast forward. That myth the myth was one of the formative archetypal, just like, the, just like Sisyphus pushing the rock. These were the myths of power that somehow formed our sense of who we are as, as human. And we could go into the myths, why I love them. They imprint us. We say, I gotta try again. Jesus, I'm always trying again to get that over the top. And I feel like it's crushing me. I am the phoenix. We've got to rise from the ashes. We have to keep going. When we entered the nuclear age, we stole the fire a second time. We stole it a second time. And this time, Zeus, in our preposterous rage. We stole the fire again. And we felt we, with the fire, we became a Zeus out of control. And we unleashed a Pandora's box of such weaponry that our fundamental mechanism became dysfunctional. For the first time in the history of humanity, the history since our birth, our basic nature, our basic gut, our basic design, which is to create and survive, there's nothing we can create that guarantees our survival for the first time ever. We have morphed ourselves. There's nothing. For the first time ever in the history of humanity, <coughs> we exist moment to moment wondering if we will survive. And that has morphed us. That has morphed us. It has morphed us in, it has positioned us in an extraordinary way, from the way in which we create these stories of end times that fill our movie theaters endlessly, to just the other day, just the other day, I saw one of those taglines that go across the, on the news that said, you know, by the year two, 2000, whatever, I won't be here, but, well, if I am, I won't remember that I'm here, but <laughs> it says that a colony will be on Mars. And the reason these scientists want it is for two. One, just to, that because they think we should become a multi-planetary species, and two, because they feel 
they have to have a second place to go if we self-destruct. It's how stupid we are. This is how stupid. And we would self-destruct because of our stupid religious mythologies. It's how, for the, our, our preposterous fairy tales. Now, this Pandora's mythology that we're at and our inability to create relies upon us finally getting to the point where the only thing that can outwit is the power of our consciousness and soul to get the mechanism back in gear. In order to do that, we have to transcend and toss out spiritual religious mythologies. They're done. They're done. And we have to get into the impersonal power that is the human spirit. The mystical power that is inherently universal within the human being. That has to be the new spirituality, is the way we are designed, is the creative force within us. That is universal. Laws have no religion. Okay? They have no religion. But prayer is that which makes the universe intimate. And what a miracle is, is when God bends the laws for you. So this universe is completely intimate, but it doesn't have a religion. And what I, have no, no, what I know all too well is that clinging to a religion, and you know that I am like a Catholic girl, but clinging to the religion instead of the mystical truths that are the gold from each religion. Clinging to the tribal aspect is the most destructive thing you can do. You take the jewels, take the laws that are hidden in the religion, take the laws, the mystical teachings, the laws in Buddhism, what Buddha taught, change is constant. Change is constant, cooperate with change. You'll fall into suffering if you do not. Take the Kabbalah, the way the tree of life exists in your body. Take the mystical traditions. Learn how the biology and the mystical traditions are built in us. Why? Because what is in one is in the whole. We are the same as the map of nature in everything. What balances us will balance nature. We are the micro of the ecological system. If we return to our own balance, we are balancing nature simultaneously. What is in one is in the whole. We are nature's balancing elements. We are one with the system. As I bring myself to balance, I'm balancing nature. We are balancing by our actions. I, do you, are you getting this? This is, we are the ecological system. It's not just the water. We are it. It's a collective mechanism. We are the inner net. Anybody, did someone else have a question? Yeah. Okay. One. Go. I need. You know what? I have a. My, I need a runner. I need a runner. Go. No, no, David. I've got a runner here. Go. Runner. Anyone? Just make sure you're fast. Keep your eyes open and go. God, am I brutal? Thank you. Hi. Okay. So. Um, my question has to do with the personal power that's affecting the rest. Um, with, it has to do with what? Personal choices? You, you were just saying that what is in one is in the whole. Right. 
and so individual choices are affecting that's right that's correct everything so this I is not for personal reading so don't go there no good so my question has to do and it keeps coming up um, this morning you said earlier that if you have an addiction and an angel comes to you and gives you um, advice or that you would pick the addiction yeah, go ahead. So, how do I... You don't pick the addiction, you are an addict. You would choose the craving over what the angel... Yeah, you would, what you would do is you would prefer to remain in your craving than the... If the, if the, if the craving is strong enough and you are thick enough into your cravings, believe me, you'd stay there. So, my question has to do with how do I more consistently make good decisions. I'll get there. No, I'll get there. Later? Get it later. Okay. I'm glad you guys are interested in that. All right, pass the microphone back and we'll move it up. We'll just keep going this way. Go ahead. If you have a question, go ahead. Um, so, pass it forward. What is the example of a dense perception um, versus a light one, and where does uh, collective prayer fall? And is it, is it like a continuum mm -hmm. of dense a dense perception is something like anytime you collectively lump a, an assumptive belief about a group of people, for example. Like all, all short people do this. All Italians do that. They're all like that. They're all like that. There's no such thing. It's the cover. Like all the people trying to come from Syria are terrorists. That's a very dark belief. That's right there. You've got it. No, you can't make sense to people who believe that. Any, any fear that's designed to stir up the, any thought that's designed to stir up the fear of a group, and you can't get through to them. You can't get through. And that's what, the, uh, that's political spin is exactly that, is exactly that. And a light-filled belief is, is where um, you might be reading something. Um, huh. I just wrote something on my Facebook. I was walking through my park, my local park, with my friend Judith the other day. It was so incredible. We meet out there with our dogs. And it's a circular park. Austin Gardens has a circular walk. It's a charming little corner park. And, and, and uh, we were walking the circle with our dogs. And it has a park bench on every qu quadrant of the circle. And we see these uh, Ziploc bags that are old, obviously. So you always think that something's crummy in there. And we see one on this one bench. And I said, Judith, don't go near that. It looks like, you know, don't. And then we see one on the next bench. And as we see that, and we're looking in it and reading, and there's a heart-shaped message in there. There's a scarf, and there are a couple of power bars in there. And we're looking, and just then a woman who we had not yet met is coming with her dog. And of course, our doggies are now talking to each other, if you know what I mean, you know. You know. Anyway, and we look, and this note says, if you're cold or hungry, this is for you. And it was an, an anonymous gift. And it left one on every bench. So now this woman comes in and she sits down. And she had a cane. She sat down with her dogs. We'd never met her. She introduces herself. We did. And she said, yeah, no. She says, I see these gifts uh, that are left by whoever this woman is. And she said, one time they were knitted scarves and one time knitted uh, gloves. And it's not every, every day, but you know, she obviously does this. And these are these, these, and I said, she's like an anonymous angel. And, and Judith and I decided right then and there that we would do something anonymous for people like that. Um, and we would do anonymous angel bags, survival bags. And in it, they would have, you know, toothbrush, one for women, one for men. The women would have some women's stuff. They would have a toothbrush, and I'd go to my, I'm going to my dentist, and I'm going to get a bag of those dentist toothbrushes that they have in the supply. And each would have one of those. Women would have female product, and they would have a comb and um, 
uh, toothpaste and you know just certain survive they get a power bar they would give this or that and I'm gonna carry them in my car so that when I come to a homeless person on the street I give them a survival bag and that's and the thought form was do something everything makes a difference everything matters everything matters and this and that and here's another power thought form you never know this is what Teresa says God in the small details of your life everywhere I would never have expected that a plast a dirty plastic bag would have changed my life but changed my life and now hopefully other people will uh, you know you pass it on but I would never have expected that that's a light that's a drop of light a light form whoever did this changed my life just like that the power of light is this golden thread that just keeps going it just keeps going and it, and and that's the thing about light it's so light just like that and it inspires and the thing about light like grace it always makes you feel better it always does something better it always alleviates a dark thought or a dark word and it leaves grace in its track and a dense one always you have to fuel it with darkness and hatred you have to fuel it with something <coughs> dense you have to keep yourself in darkness it is dark stuff Does that help you out? That was okay, thank you. Okay, but I, it's moving its way up. Go ahead. This question kind of goes back to blame um, when the word guilt got wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And being conscious of guilt. Um, I feel that in in order to stay balanced that you how guilt maybe isn't the word but you have you have to self-monitor yourself if you're doing Bingo. something wrong and you don't have to feel like oh my god i'm so guilty but there has to be something there some uh, marker that says okay i don't feel good about this i'm not going to do that you should put yourself up but how do you how, so how does that What's the, if you don't use the word guilt, what word do you use? Wait a minute. I did not answer the question. Where's our gentleman from? Where did he go? Okay, I need to answer this. What word do we use? Um, how did I get dissuaded from that? I didn't answer your question, so good thing you're back. Um, how do we use? This is where the practice of reflection comes in you have to become very reflective very reflective of your own actions and hold yourself accountable and it's not and I'll tell you one of the ways that doesn't work is saying I know I'm responsible for my actions and and now what saying that doesn't mean a thing that which is where people let themselves off the hook the next step is and therefore I am no longer going to do this you have to go the next step now back to your question I have to finish it because it was such a big question which is where did this all begin with and I left you off at Pandora's box when we stole it when we I have to finish this because you asked such a huge question when we opened the nuclear age let me just finish this what launched was it's almost like heaven it's almost like goodness the potential for goodness and the potential for darkness went nuclear and they became the new polarities and what happened also was that a new course of the evolution of humanity got launched instantly the new of what we we entered the quantum world we entered a different path of our own evolution we had to reboot and one of the 
and, and in rebooting, the rules shifted immediately. We went from a world in which our whole learning, our whole base of knowledge was that matter and the laws of matter, the laws of engineering, the laws of everything, were the laws of reality to all of a sudden entering the world of quantum physics where the laws of energy took precedent over the laws of matter. Which meant that the world that we had grown up in was no longer valid. The thought world was now taking order over the form. Suddenly the world behind our eye was becoming more valid than the world in front of our eye. Our inner, inner space was the new frontier, an outer space, instead of the space we were living on. Okay, this, this, was, this is so huge as we realize we don't know anything about inner space. Now, what happened simultaneously is that in addition to living in this world where we could self-destruct any second, which is a whole new psychic climate, we became the first generations to grow up with television. The first generations to grow up with the inner frontier opened. So now we also have TV. Whoever heard of TV? Well, we did. So now we're growing up and now we have these characters growing up alongside of us that no other generations ever did, including all the little magical children that are now popping out of our unconscious that we didn't even know we had, including all the little characters from Disneyland. So for the first time, we're seeing all these little role models for magical children. And there was no such thing as a role model for a magical child ever, ever in the history of ever. So now we're seeing magical children living magical castles and imagining all the magical lives that Walt Disney is putting forward. And all of us suddenly want a nanny that comes in through a, through a chimney and pops this and flies this and people are flying through the airs and there's magicians and this and that. And this is our role model for what we now think is the ideal childhood. Well, lo and behold, what pops out simultaneously in therapy is the wounded child. So now, these are our two role models for the child archetype. The magical child, which none of us had. None of us had. Did you have a flying nanny? No. Did you? Hmm. What kind of childhood did you have? Oh, abusive, neglected, horrible. These became our two child archetypes, orphaned, wounded, and magical. This became the formation of the social childhood of America in the 50s, the 60s, the Donna Reed, the woman who went to bed with pearls on. <laughs> These became the ideal and of course, that was kind of like, so now we have therapy. Then we have the, then what happens is we hit the 60s. And there's this kind of eruption of the light of spirituality. We can, we gotta break out of this nightclub. There's love and there's light and there's this massive geyser of eruption of what the soul could be. It was a nuclear meltdown. Of, and, and all this eruption that just kind of, bam, it hit the seventh chakra and it burst open. Like this sense of we could be anything. We could love to the heights. We were high on love and we were high on high. The drugs came out, the everything, the potential of what we could be in, the, in that. And then the potential of how dark we were on the other side with the civil rights movement how dark we were and how light we could be, collided in the 60s. 
And it took that, it actually took that to break the limits of how much of a hold the tribe had on us. To break the boundaries sexually, to break them eth the ethnic boundaries, the traditions, to start the social, the feminist, to start the ball, because the United States is many things, but one of the things it cannot stand is to dole out freedom. Freedom's an illusion. It cannot tolerate to dole, dole out freedom. Civil rights in the 60s, are you serious? Are you serious? And now it's trying to reel in the rights. Reel it in. So it breaks out in the 60s. And we are trying to break out. What did we discover? What came out of the unconscious in the 60s was the victim. What we gave rise to in the 60s was the beginning of vo vocalizing the inner victim, the inner wounded child, the wounds of society. And as the 70s rolled around and the revolutions were done, we decided, you know, spirituality is not everything it's cracked up to be. It's nice to have the spiritual potential, but this victim stuff, this is good. What could be our highest potential? And this is when they went this way. And what we gave rise to at this time was the inner self. This thing called the inner self. That when people break away from the tribe, they do so in a revolution. They do so out of pain, out of trauma, out of healing, and the out of wounds. And the first thing they discover is their fragile, wounded self. They have to start articulating that. And then they discover their victim, where they've been victimized. And they have to kind of deal with that. The third thing they discover is the power of having been victimized, of having been wounded. And they set up a course of discovery along those lines called woundology. And then they set up their power base with that. And it looks like they want to get out of it and it smells like it. But in fact, they rather like it and they start to build up their Pandora's box, hang their pictures on the wall. And it becomes a comfort zone, a place they really don't want to get out of. It looks like they do, but they don't. They don't. Because, and the society became a coddling society to these wounded people, to the wounds. And that's what we became. And it took the backbone out of our society in many ways. And our effort to support the wounded, to support the wounds, we in fact have become, helped them become weaker than stronger. And now we went politically correct ad infinitum. Instead of saying, I'm going to give you three times to tell me about your wound, then get going. You get three times. You don't get to live there. You don't get to live there for years. That's not serving you. It's not serving you. How is that serving you? Tell me how that's serving you. It's not. It's not serving you. We have to find a way where this gets you through but it doesn't weaken you. It shouldn't make you allergic to everything. It shouldn't make you so fragile. It shouldn't make you. We are not healthier than we were in the 50s. We are more sick. We have more immune disorders. We have more allergies. We have become a sicker species, not stronger, but more toxic. When we have all this healthy food, all of this knowledge about health, we have every religion in the world we can go to, and in fact, we've never had more sp spiritual crises than we do now. We have become exactly the opposite of what we set out to be. 
which is spiritually centered, healthy, balanced. We have never been more fractured and unsure of ourselves. Don't you think that's interesting? No, I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I have no idea. How many of you are therapists? Okay. Do you find this in your practices? All the time. Okay. Right. Yes. What is the key differences between conscious and intuition? I'm going to go, go into conscious. Conscious? What do you mean? Or con I don't want to say consciousness. Consciousness means nothing. It's, yeah. it's nothing. It's a catch-all word. It means nothing. It has no meaning at all. Conscience. Conscience is the mechanism that has an association with what is right and what is wrong. No, it is actually conscience. Your conscience is in your inherent wiring. It's in your nature. Your nature. Your first instinct is a gut instinct. You're, you're the organic nature of God in your blood and your bones. And, and it is like survival. Nobody has to tell a human being, you know, um, uh, that we don't steal. You actually know that. There's a law in our system. I mean, the, I remember how many times in, in graduate school in theology, it's very interesting discussions, but we know by instinct we don't do that. We know by instinct we don't kill. We just know it. It's in the nature of our species, just like how many times people will say dogs will not make a mess in their own bed. Why? Because it's the nature of their species. The nature of ours is that we do not kill our own babies. Uh, an indication of how toxic we have become, how many of our own laws of our nature we have violated is that we are now killing our own and not batting an eye and not passing laws to stop it. Okay, in our gut, we are designed to know right from wrong, to have a sense that this, if we cross this line, we will violate our own humanity instincts. We won't be able to stay human. Just like if I harm people who have not harmed me, and I sell my soul doing this, if I take money and, 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 and look the other way as people beat people who have done nothing, in order for me to survive that, I have to start believing that they did something wrong. This is what made a Nazi. This is what made a Nazi. I have to buy into a creed, a, a creed, a dark creed, that those people, just like buying into the creed about Muslims, get them out of the country, don't let them in. This is the identical thing that happened in, 19, in the 1930s. You've got to be able to see it. You're blind if you don't. It is identical. And it could be anything. It could be Martians. It could be people with blonde hair or people with, with, with red hair. It doesn't matter. It's the identical thing. They're all like this. And all that does is it builds the fear. Your conscience is the mechanism that says, this is not right. And then you have a choice. Because the, 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 the seed of your conscience is actually the, your soul. But then you have a choice to say, hmm, am I going to listen to it or not? And that's where your choice comes in. And you can, you can bury that. You can bury that. You could decide. I don't want to listen to this. And when you morph your own conscience, you will eventually feel it in your body because you won't, your body 
will have to warehouse the lie. You've begun to lie. You're now, you're now a liar. And so, like a ship, you're beginning to fall off the bal is it balanced? You're beginning to tilt. And so you're lying to yourself that you are actually straight and going right with the wind. And in order to maintain the lie, you have to start lying to your other systems. You have to lie about how you feel. You have to lie about what you're thinking. In order to maintain being crooked, other systems have to compensate. So you have to start telling yourself big, huge stories that aren't true. Well, it's their fault anyway. Well, when did that start? Because everybody knows that. So now you pull on tribal stories. Now you pull out tribal stories because you need tribal support. Everybody says that. Well, who's everybody? Everybody. In order to live with lies. And this is the way people do this. And so what's the difference between that and intuition? What's it? No, in, there is no difference. Your intuition relies on your conscience. It goes like this, and it goes up in levels, which is what you get a sense of this, and then there's higher, there's a sense of direct revelation. Your, the, your intuitive system is like this. It has a voice for every one of those. It's got, an, it's got a way that it talks through every one of the chakras. Does that help? I, I'm, just, I'm just, yes. How, um, I'm going to try to articulate my question because it integrates a few things you are saying. You have to articulate. It, yeah. it integrates. So I'm going to try my best. So, okay. Um, how do we, when, when you were talking about us breaking free from the tribe, and... Uh, yeah, we got a mic and route. Whoa, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I got to get this. I know how to do this. Go. When you were talking about uh, breaking free from the tribe, so that there has to be uh, some sort of betrayal that will be perceived by the tribe, right? So you are betraying the tribe. So you have two questions here. Um, it may trigger some guilt in the person breaking free from the tribe. How do you start your quest of self-discovery? I guess you already started it since you broke free without falling into narcissism. Ah, what a great question. Oh my God, I could hug you. <laughs> you don't and you can't. Narcissism is essential. Can you believe I just said that? I sort of can, but I wanted Right, to yes, no, no. You have to go through a stage of narcissism. It's essential, and in fact, the first stage of it, I'll even tell you how to be good at it. Um, and we'll talk about that after lunch. There is an essential stage of narcissism. Healthy narcissism? Yes, there is, because yeah. Because you can go to yeah. the end of yeah. the spectrum, yeah. which is the unhealthy narcissism. Yeah, yeah, there is. Now, Not, um, yeah. Can I ask, uh, so, uh, regarding yeah. to her question about wait, conscience wait. and in intuition. Wait, 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 wait. Because, uh, where's my glasses? Wait. Wait. Yeah. So, um, metaphor of the uh, the building, right? And that you refer to. Yeah. And I remember you saying that the higher you are in that building, the more gray areas you hit. So things are not necessarily only right or wrong, but there are gray areas. The um, reality becomes more abstract. Uh, you open up different sorts of <laughs> perceptual. Um, abilities. So how, how do you, when you are at that level, how do you integrate that with conscience, which is right or wrong? 
versus sometimes having to make decisions, sometimes right. medical decisions in which gray areas need to be considered. Right, you know, there is a um, right and wrong is a polarity that then you expand. It's not hard and cold. This is when, you know, in, it's like that wonderful, wonderful story that I put into the internet. I think it was, it's such a great teaching where if, if, we, if all of us were off the planet and we saw two people in the North and the South Pole, and they both thought they lived on the planet by themselves. And we are watching them and they're coming and for the first time they're gonna meet at the equator. And they both think they have the planet to themselves. And, the, and they know we're watching. And the one says to the South Pole, who are you? And the, North Pole sa and the South Pole says to the North, who are you? And they both think it's all theirs and they have no idea there's another half of the planet but we do. So they look at you and they say, you, you decide, who, who has the, who's got the real story? And you realize if you decide to pick one, you are, you are choosing to engage in a, in a fantasy, in a myth, okay? But they live in a world where there is only one choice. It's either right or wrong, my side or his side. And you know that the higher truth is that if you both got together, you'd have a hole and you'd get, it'd be just fine. And that's the higher truth. So after a while, right and wrong is no longer the paradigm. You retire that paradigm and then you go to the next floor, which is now it's about truth. What's the truth going here? It's no longer about right and wrong. You go to, into a thinking that's more antinomial, which is, it's no longer about right or wrong, it's about you're right and I'm right simultaneously. I have, because right or wrong is about my wanting to win. I gotta get out of that state of mind. I've gotta get into the mindset which is, from your perspective, you're as valid as I am. So now what's the truth here? The next perspective, it's about an archetypal dynamic. I have to be very impersonal about this. So you start going higher and higher and higher about what the actual dynamic is. I'll put the, I'll put the building back out. Maybe I'll have, David will put this board on the stage during lunchtime and I'll, I'll use the, the building because it's so helpful after lunch. So as you have you that, are holding everybody else up and it's lunchtime. <laughs> I, I, it's lunchtime. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks everybody.